Good afternoon, everyone. So let us remember what we were studying, what we finished last week. So we are looking at the family of tent maps. And in particular at the tent map with slope 3. And we have studied already what happens outside the unit interval 0, 1. Everything goes to minus infinity. So we are concentrating on this interval 0, 1. Um, so this point here is the point 1 third. This point here is the point 2 thirds. We have these two closed intervals, 0, 1 third. This interval here we call I0. This closed interval here, 2 thirds, 1, we call I1, and this interval here we call delta. And we define the set lambda equals the set of points x that stay inside this interval, inside one of these two intervals for all time. If we understand the dynamics on this set, this set is invariant by definition, and forward invariant, in the sense that if x belongs to this set, obviously the image f of x also belongs to this set. So there is a dynamics on this set. A priori, just looking at the map, we only know that there are these two fixed points in this set. But the theorem we're going to show is that, in fact, lambda is a Cantor set. In particular, it's a big set. It has a lot of points in here. And the dynamics on lambda is non-trivial. And the set of periodic points is uh, countable, is dense. What did I, uh, how did I say? Is dense. And f restricted to lambda is transitive, which means there exists a point x in lambda such that the omega limit set of x equals lambda. This is the definition of what we mean by transitive. So in particular, not all points are periodic. So, how are we going to prove this theorem? First of all, we are going to consider the set so let okay, so this is the statement. In fact, as in the course of the proof, we will prove additional information about this structure. So let's sigma 2 plus is equal to the space of all sequences of 0 and 1. So this is the sequences A given by A0, A1, A2, and so on, where each AI is either 0 or 1. So what we're doing is we're going to implement the strategy of symbolic coding that I described in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, I described in abstract what you do if you just have a space, a dynamical system on the space, and you partition the space. So here, it's a slight generalization of that. We don't really have a partition of the space, but we know that all the dynamics we're interested occurs inside these two elements. And so these two elements are a cover of the space. Any element in the space in the set lambda always for every it that belongs to I0, I1. So we can use these two as the elements to code 
the dynamics. So we introduce this space of all sequences of zeros and ones that correspond to these two. And we define for A in the sequence um, let I A bar equals the set of points X such that F N of X belongs to I a i for all i greater than or equal to zero. So I remember when I wrote it down, I wrote it down in a very abstract setting. So now we can think very concretely what this means. So this means the following. I, you give me a sequence of zeros and ones an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. And I say, OK, let me consider the set of points whose combinatorics in terms of these two intervals has exactly that sequence. So if your sequence is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, then I say, is there a point that starts in I0, its image is in I1, its second image is in I1, its third image is in I1, for however many ones I have in the sequence. And then when there's a 0, it's kth images in I0, and so on. So the full forward orbit follows exactly the pre-assigned combinatorics. So as we said, we know, for example, that if you just take the sequence 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, then which point will satisfy that? The fixed point is always in I0 all the time. If I give you the fixed point 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, then this other fixed point. There's another fixed point here. Right? What if I give you the sequence 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0? So the orbit of 1. That's right. The orbit of 1, if you look at the image of the point 1 is in I1, and its image is in I0, and then it stays in I0 all the time. So can we find some other points? Suppose I give you the sequence um, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. What? 2 over 3. 1 over 3 would be what? What's the sequence of this? Yes, but what's the sequence of this point? No, because it starts with the position of the point itself, right? When n is equal to 0, when when uh, i is equal to 0, then this is the interval in which x belongs. Right? So this point here has what sequence? 0, and then it maps to 1, and then 0, 0, 0. Okay? So you can see, you can start constructing some sequence. This point here has a sequence 1 because it belongs to i1. Then the next iterate is 1, so it's 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. Okay. Here is the fixed point. This fixed point has the sequence 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which is the sequence 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The pre-image of this fixed point, right? So there's a point here. There's some point here, and that has the starts with 0, and then its image falls exactly here on the fixed point. So this code is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? So here we're taking specific points. But what I'm saying which is quite remarkable, is that for any sequence, well, I'm not yet saying it. I will say that. For the moment, I've defined this object. As I said, now we want to ask whether this object is non-empty. So is it true that for any sequence of zero ones, I can give you 27 zeros followed by 200 ones, followed by 3 million zeros, followed by 1 1, any sequence I give you, there exists a point that does exactly that. Okay, this is the question. And this is the answer. So proposition for all A in I a bar. Sorry, for all A in sigma 2 plus 
we have that i a bar is non-empty. Yes? Sorry, sorry, yes. Uh, I. Okay. And consists of a single point. We will also then prove as a separate lemma that two different sequences correspond to two different points, right? So there's, in the end, we will get a bijection between that. So this, because we've already shown that we get a conjugacy, we're in the process soon of showing that there's a conjugacy between the shift map on two symbols and the set lambda in here. Okay. So how do we show this? Well, let's fix some set A, so let A bar equals A0, A1, A2, and so on, is in sigma 2 plus. And let us define the finite sets A0 to An minus 1. be equal to the set of points x such that fi of x belongs to ai for all i equals 0 up to n minus 1. does this mean? It means we just look at a finite block. For example, if we just take uh, one index here, if we take n equals 1, right, then a, i a 0 is the set of points that belongs to i a 0. So if you take n equals 1, for the two different possibilities for the first digit, you just get i 0 and i 1. Right? So it follows obviously from the definition that these sets are nested, right? Notice that i a zero, a n minus one, is contained in i a zero to a n minus two, okay? Which is contained in i a zero, which is contained in the unit interval i, because. This is the set of points in which this holds up to time n minus 2. This is the set of points in which the same thing holds for the same sequence here, plus you've got an extra condition. So these are clearly nested sequences. And moreover, just from the definition, we clearly get that a i a bar is simply equal to the uh, nested intersection, all n greater than or equal to 1, of i a0, an minus 1. Okay? Because just from the definition, right? Because this is the set of points. If the set belongs to Ia, it must belong to this Ia, n minus 1 for all n minus 1 for all n. 
So we've got a nested sequence of sets. Again, they could be empty, right? It could be that there's a certain, it could be that this is not empty, but then if you look at the set of points in here, whose image you add another term, n here whose image belongs to a n, suddenly there's no points that actually have that combinatorics, so it could become empty, right? So we need to show that this is not empty. And however, so what is sufficient, if we can show that each of these is a closed non-empty set, then this intersection is non-empty because the nested intersection of closed non-empty sets is non-empty. Right? So, So it is sufficient to show that for each n greater than or equal to 1, a0 to a n minus 1 is a closed non-empty interval. So there's a general results in topology, probably you've done this, that in general topological spaces, nested intersection of closed non-empty sets is, is closed and non-empty. In the case of intervals, you can prove it directly, okay, I will leave it to you as an exercise. If you have a closed sequence of non-empty intervals, then you can just take the endpoints on one side and the other endpoints on the other side and can never cross, so you can show easily this fact for the intervals, okay, but I will leave this an exercise. So how are we going to show that this is true? We need to show that this is true for an arbitrary A, right, because we fixed A arbitrary, there's no condition. So by showing this, for arbitrary A, we'll show, this, that it, we'll show that it's true for every A, and therefore we will have showed the first part of the result here. So we will prove it by induction. On N. So what is the first step of the induction? N equals zero. Right? For N equals zero, Sorry, for n equals uh, 1, right? This is not for n, n equals 1. For n equals 1, what do we have? For n equals 1, we have i of a0. Um, is either, so i of a0 equals I zero if A zero equals zero or I of A one equals I one if A zero equals one. Right from the definition because for N equals zero, this is just the set of points X such that X belongs to I of A zero or uh, sorry I zero or I one depending on these values. So this is clearly non empty interval because it's I zero all I want, depending on what the value of A0 is. Yes? Let's see that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. But there's one crucial property. I mean, so far, we've, we're not going to be able to base the induction on this, because this is just the observation of what these are. So we're going to use the extra ingredient in the induction is the following. What are the images of IA0? Moreover, we have that F from I0 to I and F from I1 to I. are bijections. 
in fact, uh, homeomorphism, let's say. In fact, in this case, they are linear. Okay, so I0 maps to all of 0, 1. I is equal to 0, 1. Remember, I is the whole interval. So now we can state the induction assumption, inductive assumption. But you can already see how the inductive assumption is going to go because the fact that I0 maps to all of I means can we can conclude something about the next step, right? About the intervals with two, with two terms, A0 and I1. Because inside I0, there is going to be one subinterval that maps under F to I0, and another subinterval that maps under F to I1. And inside I1, there is one interval that maps to I1, and another interval here that maps to I0. So there's going to be exactly four intervals, I0, 0, I0, 1, I1, 1, and I1, 0, here. So that shows that if you look at the, the uh, elements of order 2, you have four possibilities, and all, each of those possibilities is a closed interval, is a non-empty closed interval, right? which is what we're trying to show. So let's suppose inductively, Suppose, inductively, that for n greater than or equal to 1, there exists exactly 2 to the n disjoint closed intervals. I A0 A n minus 1 corresponding to all possible finite sequences A0 A n minus 1 of length n with a i belonging to 0 or 1 for i equals 0 up to n minus 1. Suppose, moreover, that Fn from I0, n minus 1, to I is a homeomorphism. Tell me if there's something you don't understand here. So, of length n, because there's nth terms here, right? A zero to n minus one. So there's n possibilities, choices of zeros and ones here. So there's two to the n possibilities, right? Simply all. 2 to the n possibilities of, of zeros and ones, of n, of a sequence of n zeros and ones. What's the relation between this a, a0, a1, and a n minus 1 with our fixed a? Maybe they differ? So we need to show, 
So the, the A that it, we're proving the theorem is an arbitrary A. So even though it's fixed, it can be any A, right? So we're going to show, in the proof we're going to show all together that for any A this will work, right? And so I am stating, I'm proving something a little bit more general. What I'm stating at this, set of, set of, set of, at this stage of the induction is that for any finite sequence, of length n, there exists a closed interval that satisfies this condition. In other words, at stage n of this construction, there exists exactly 2 to the n such intervals. Each one of is of this form, but all of them appear for any, any combination of zeros and ones. Okay? And for each one, we have the property that fn maps this interval homeomorphically. In fact, in this case, it will be linearly, but homeomorphically to the whole interval 0, 1. What I just wrote before was exactly the step 0 of this induction, right? So what I wrote before was n equals uh, 1. For n equals 1, there exists two disjoint intervals Ia of the form Ia0 uh, corresponding to all possible sequences A0, An1 of length n, so of length 1 with A0 in 0, 1. So I had I0 and I1. Those were the only two possibilities at the 0 set. And I showed that for n equals 1, I have I of A0 maps to I, and I of A1 maps to I. That's exactly the 0 step of the induction of this. So what do I need to show now? Remember that I'm trying to show that given one, maybe this was a little question really, just to remind ourselves, what I'm trying to show is that given one infinite sequence, if you take the nested finite terms, they're all nested sequence of closed intervals, right? And I am trying to show therefore that for any sequence you have here, it's a, it's a closed interval. The nestedness comes directly from the definition. So I just need to show that each one of these is a non-empty closed interval. That's all I need to show. So how do I show this? Can you tell me? This is now the next step is kind of immediate almost. I need to show that the same is true for n plus 1. So I need to show that this holds for n plus 1. So I need to show that there exists 2n plus 1 disjoint closed intervals of the form a0, an minus 1, an corresponding to all possible finite sequence with an extra term here, okay? So what do, I, what do I need to show? I just need to show that for each one of these, I have two more possibilities, one with the zero and one with the one here. And then I have all the possibilities, right? And this is obvious that this is true by this property here. This maps homeomorphically into I, and I contains I0 and I1. So that means like inside this interval here, there are two subintervals that under this homeomorphism get mapped to I0 and to I1. And that gives me the two subintervals that I need. So you, you will divide it into two parts, closed case, and you will take any two closed subjects in this row. So I didn't understand your question. For example, in the second uh, step. Yes. Yes, yes. And we took two closed intervals. Yes, and next step, now we have to take each one two intervals. The, the next step, we subdivide each of these intervals into two subintervals. Yes. Yes. How to divide? Okay, so let me write down, let me write down the, the, the argument here in the general case, and then we will check how it works in the, in the first case, okay, just to, to clarify. But in the first case, it's just easy, so now we have... Um, um, okay, so since so we use the fact that Fn I A0 to I N minus 1 to I is a homeomorphism
then clearly I a zero a n minus one zero which is equal to the set of points x in I a zero to I n minus one such that f n of x belongs to I zero and I a zero a n minus one one which is equal to x in i a0 a n minus 1 such that f n x belongs to i1 are non empty closed intervals. Because I zero and I one, okay, because I zero and I one are disjoint closed sub intervals of I. So let's see how it works in the first case, right? For n equals 1, we have i0 and i1 are the only two, are the 2 to the 1, the two disjoint intervals of the form ia0, okay? They map homeomorphically onto 0, 1. But what is 0, 1? 0, 1, again, remember, this 0, 1 on the vertical axis is only a representation of the real zero one, I say, I repeat this every time, right? The dynamics is happening here on the horizontal axis. The graph is just a way to help us look at the dynamics, right? What is really happening here is that this interval zero one third is mapped onto this interval zero one. And this interval I one is mapped, as you can see from the graph, onto all of zero one, okay? So if you write a, make a copy of I zero here, and you make a copy of I1 here. You see that the homeomorphism that maps I0 to all of I means that there exists a smaller interval here that maps to I0 homeomorphically. And another smaller interval, another small interval here that maps to I1 homeomorphically, right, from the dynamics like this. And by definition, I will call this interval here I0, coming from the fact that this point in is I0, and 0, coming the, from the fact that the image of these points lands in I0. And I will call this interval I01, because the first 0 corresponds to n equals 0, the fact that f of x, belong, that f of x belongs to... Uh, from the definition that, that x belongs to i0 and 1 here because f of x belongs to i1, right? And similarly here, so this is 2 thirds, this is 1, I have one interval here. What's the coding for this interval here? 1, 1, exactly. And then I have one interval here, which is i1, 0. Okay, and this is really in this particular case just exactly what I've done here. So I've used that's why I emphasize that this is the key ingredient in the induction. Really, is this fact here? Is the fact that we have because this maps to this homeomorphically, then there is a subinterval of this which I denote like this, which is the set of points inside here which map into I zero just like we did here. And this is exactly 
by definition, this is exactly the same definition as previously I had, right? Because the fact that x is not here, in here means that x belongs to Ia0, f of x belongs to Ia1, and so on. And here I'm adding the last term, which is the fact that f of n, n of x belongs to I0 and I1. So I get 2. Okay? So for each one of these 2 to the n disjoint intervals, I get each one splits into two disjoint closed subintervals, which have 0 and 1 here. So if I do this for each one of these, I get exactly 2 to the n plus 1 disjoint subintervals satisfying all the properties. Okay, so this shows that for any finite sequence, this interval here is a non-empty closed interval. And from what I wrote before, the infinite, the interval given by the infinite sequence is just the uh, nested intersection of all these finite intervals. And therefore, each of these is a closed interval, and therefore, the intersection is non-empty. And that completes the proof that the intersection is non-empty. Does that make sense? Yeah? <laughs> so now we need to show that it's a single point. How do we know that there may not be, they may be more than a single point? Can, is it possible that a nested intersection of eight closed intervals is more than a single point? How is that? Give me an example of an infinite nested intersection of closed intervals is more than a single point. No, closed. Closed intervals. Compact intervals. <laughs> right. Okay. So you can take Jn equals, for example, the interval 0, 1 plus 1 over n. Okay, or you can take even 1 over n, 1 plus 1 over n, anyway. So it's not obvious. So how are we going to show that this nested sequence of closed intervals is a single point? That's right. All we need to do is to estimate the diameter of these intervals, right? Because we know that this nested sequence is connected because this is a sequence of nested intervals, so we know the nested intersection is just one connected piece. It's an interval itself. If it's a single point, that corresponds to being a trivial interval. So we just need to show that the length of these intervals goes to zero. And why does it go to zero? So to show that a a bar equals nested intersection of A0, An minus 1 is a single point. It is sufficient to show that the length of A0, An minus 1 goes to zero as n tends to infinity. And how do we know the length of this interval here? Just what? What power series? Why is that? Huh? <laughs> right. So I zero is one third. I zero zero is one over nine. Why is that? Because these are exactly one third, one third, one third, and then this maps linearly to the whole interval. 
and therefore these three bits are also of equal length because they map to parts that are one third. So this divides the interval I zero into three equal parts. So this is one third of a third, one third of a third, and so on. Right? More formally, how can we state it in the general sense? The general, uh, in general, well, we know that Fn, Fn from I A0, An minus 1 to I is a homeomorphism, but we know much more, okay? Because this is just the interval. These are intervals that always stay either inside I0 or I1. They are mapping it out. It's a small interval. It maps either into I0 or I1, and then it maps again. By definition, these intervals, they always stay inside I0 and I1. And what's the derivative inside I0 and I1? It's always either 3 or minus 3, right? So the absolute value of the derivative is always 3. For Fn, the absolute value of the derivative is 3 to the n, right? And then we just have mean value theorem that says, okay, so since the derivative is equal to 3 to the n for all x in i a0, i n minus 1, okay, then we can just write that a, okay, so i, the length of i equals 3 to the n times the length of a, i0, an minus 1, and so i a0, an minus 1, is equal to 3 to the minus n, which goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. And this completes the proof of the proposition. Okay, I want to make also a little remark which we will need later. That follows from the construction. So, um, you can start seeing the structure of these intervals, right? It's a little bit like the construction of the Cantor set for those of you who've done the construction of the Cantor set, because you see, we have a central element here that's delta, that is the whole, everything escapes, right? And then the intervals that stay inside zero, one, inside these two intervals for two iterates, are formed by these four <laughs> closed intervals whose complement are these three open intervals, right? And then each of these, what happens to each of these? Well, this interval here, after one iterate, it maps to I1. And after two iterate, it maps to I0. So we've just shown it in the general case. So F2 of this maps to all of I0. So that means that it will be mapped, and it maps in an affine way, in a linear way. So that means that inside here, there will be two intervals, two small intervals. Right? And um, each of these, after three iterations will map to all of this because after two iterations this will map to either i0 or i1 and the other one will also map to i0 or i1 and what you've got is a complement this little bit here that falls inside delta and that then escapes right so from the construction we have that Two new intervals, two new intervals, let's say these ones, i a 0, a n minus 1, 0, and i a 0, a n minus 1, 1, right? 
the two that we construct by using the fact that you have at some scale a small interval that at time n maps onto 0, 1, you get 2. They are separated, so they have length, have length. These are of order n plus 1, so they have length 3 to the minus n plus 1, right? And are separated by a pre-image of delta, which also has length phi to the minus n plus 1. Right? Because these gaps also have the same length of the intervals that we are creating. So in particular, so we have that if x and y belong to lambda and um, x minus y less than 3 to the n minus n plus 1, they're closer than this distance here, then x and y belong to the same interval i a0 to a n. Because any two intervals of this level are separated by a preimage of delta which is of at least of length phi to the minus n plus 1 or bigger. And similarly, we have that, moreover, conversely, if x and y are in lambda and x minus y is greater than phi to the minus n plus 1, they necessarily belong to different, to distinct intervals of the form Well, that's right. Then it depends because you could have, um, they could be the endpoints of the same interval or they could be the endpoints of intervals that are next to each other. So both cases can occur. But you know for sure that if you have these strict equalities, then it gives you some condition about what can happen. Okay, let's have a couple of minutes break and then we'll come back. Okay. Okay, so this proves that the sets IA are well defined. And this allows us to define the map H. which associates to each sequence the point IA. The point IA, because it's a single point. 
There exists a point, and we've got the single point. Yes. I is a set, but it's a set made of a single point. The this 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 is a single point. Is a single point. It's a one point set. It's a one point set. Okay. <laughs> Let's agree to identify that one point set with the point that it contains. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the last thing we would like to show is injectivity of this. Then we will get a nice bijection and a, a nice conjugacy. Right? So the injectivity, we've essentially already proved it. But let me give a little argument here. So H is injective so what does it mean that H is injective that if you fix two sequences um, uh, cannot correspond to the same point. But this, yes, two different sequences. Uh, so the injective, yes, injective means that if you take two different sequences, so wait, uh, no, this is not what I want to show. I want to show that, uh, so what I've shown is that for every A, we have a non-empty single point here. Yes, so now I want to show that if I have two different sequences, you cannot have the same point. But this is kind of, uh, Obvious, right? What is the reason for that? I mean, there's several, there's several ways to see it. What's, what's the argument there? Yes, there's many ways. One of them is, first of all, this, that if two points are at any distance apart, then for sufficiently large n, they will satisfy this condition, and therefore they will belong to distinct intervals here. And so they cannot belong. If they belong to distinct intervals here, then obviously they will belong to distinct intervals of this form. Right? Or if two, sorry, it's the other way around. If two sequences are different, then at some point uh, they must have a, a different, OK, let's put it in a slightly more s simpler way. If two sequences are different, all the points in here have this sequence as their combinatorics. Right? So you cannot have a single point having two different combinatorics because that would mean that this point at time n is both in, his, in I0 and in I1, actually. So the injectivity is much more basic. It's kind of included in this, in this definition. Right? Because all these points here, if you look at the definition, OK, so let me write it here. Actually, proof. I a bar is equal to the set of points x such that fix belongs to ai for all i greater than or equal to 0. This is the definition of i a bar. So if you just look at the definition, you see that it's obvious that if you have, if a bar is different from b bar, okay, then there exists some i greater than or equal to 0, such that ai is different from bi, okay, and so we cannot have, obviously, uh, and so i a bar is different from i b bar. Yeah, so this is really, injectivity is almost intrinsic to the definition that what we're doing is we're coding the combinatorics of the point. So what we have here, therefore, is a conjugacy. So H is a 
find you guess see between f on lambda and sigma on sigma 2 plus it's a conjugacy so as an immediate corollary of this conjugacy what do we have so we have that lambda um, is uncountable because f is a h is a bijection and we know that sigma 2 plus is uncountable we have something about periodic points, right? What do we know, remember, about the dynamics of sigma? We studied it last time. We know that it has infinitely many periodic points of all periods, right? And f is stricted to lambda has infinitely many periodic points. Okay, so now to go a little bit deeper into this uh, conjugacy, we would like to show that H is a topological conjugacy. So we would like to have a topology on sigma 2 plus and show that H is a homomorphism between this topology here and the topology on lambda induced by the uh, Euclidean metric here. And also we will want to study the topological structure of the dynamics here. So that's how we're going to get our final result that the periodic points are dense here or that the, there's a, a dense orbit here. We will just show that this is a topological conjugacy and then we just need to show the properties, the corresponding properties here and the all topological properties that are preserved by topological conjugacies. So the first thing we do, is let's state Let's write down what the metric is on sigma 2, which we're going to use to define the topology. So define a distance function between two sequences as the sum from i equals 0 to infinity of ai minus bi over 2 to the i. lemma D is a metric sigma 2 plus so I will leave this for you as an exercise okay to remember they recall the definitions of a metric and just check basically the triangle inequality okay it's not difficult to check so what does this do? Let's, uh, to work with this metric, we need a little bit of intuition about what this metric does. As you can see, what this metric sums up, so what's the maximum distance between two points here? Uh, maybe two. For i equals zero, for i equals zero, this is one, and the rest of the sum is at most one, okay? So the maximum distance is two, okay? And when are two sequences close to each other? When the sum is small, yes. <laughs> but when is the sum small? The first part should be equal, exactly, right? Because if, for example, for i equals 0, the first terms are different, already the distance is at least one. So they're far apart, even if everything else is the same, right? The distance is one. But if the first two million terms are the same, then the tail is very, very small, okay? So the way to think of this metric is that two sequences are close if the first large number of terms is close. That's the intuition you need to have about this metric. In fact, just as a, as a remark, this is the topology. If you did in the, in the, I don't know, in the course in topology, I don't know if you did product 
topologies. But if you think of the space sigma 2 plus as the product, the countable product, like this, which is the space of sequences, and you take the discrete topology on 0, 1, and you take the product of these topologies, you get the same topology, basically. So you get a topology in which sequences converge if they have larger and larger initial finite blocks converge. OK, that was just a comment. There are many metrics. As usually metric spaces, there are many metrics that induce the same topology. And there's several. If you look at the books, you might find some slightly different uh, definitions, but they all are essentially equivalent. OK? So uh, let's formalize, because we will use this a lot, let's formalize a little bit these properties of the metrics that we just said. So let me write this as a lemma. So for all epsilon, there exists n epsilon greater than 0 with n epsilon going to infinity as epsilon goes to 0, such that if ai equals bi for all i equals 0 to an epsilon, then the distance between a and b is less than epsilon. This is just what we said. If. We'll do the calculation in a second, but I think it's clear that this corresponds to what we said, right? So if. The, 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 the relevant thing, in some sense, the reason why I'm writing this as a calculation is just to make sure we see that this n epsilon depends only on epsilon and not on the specific sequence. Right? For every epsilon, there exists an n that depends only on epsilon, such that if two sequences are the same for the first n epsilon terms, then they are close by epsilon. And the n depends only on epsilon. Right? And conversely, for all n greater than 0, there exists epsilon n greater than 0 with epsilon n going to 0 as n tends to infinity, such that if the distance between a and b is less than epsilon n, then a i equals b i for all i equals 0 to n. This also, if you think about it a bit, is obvious. What this is saying is that um, if two sequences are close in this metric, then they must be close. The first few, the first initial terms must be the same. Sorry? OK, so let me do the calculation, which is very simple. I could leave it as an exercise, but I will do it because, uh, because we will use this a lot, actually, in, in, in all the estimates, the calculations. So it's good to really fix it in your mind, OK? So proof. So um, let epsilon greater than 0 and n epsilon sufficiently large such that 2 to the minus n epsilon is less than epsilon. Okay, in fact, this is a ex fairly explicit way of defining n epsilon in terms of epsilon by this condition. Then, if ai equals bi for all i equals 0 to n epsilon, we have that the distance between a and b, which is equal to the sum 
AI minus BI over 2 to the I is equal to the sum I equals N epsilon. Uh, yes, an epsilon plus 1 to infinity of AI minus BI over 2 to the I, which is less than or equal to the sum I equals N epsilon plus 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the I, which is less than or equal to 1 over 2 to the N epsilon, which is less than epsilon. So completely straightforward calculation, but just to clarify this. Now let n greater than 0, and let epsilon n equals 2 to the minus n. Then if the distance between a bar and b bar is less than epsilon n. Suppose by contradiction that there exists some j in zero n, okay, such that a j is different from b j, then we would have that the distance, um, yeah, then we would just have a contradiction. The distance between A and B, which is equal to the sum AI minus BI over 2 to the I, would be greater than or equal 1 over 2 to the J, which is greater than or equal to 1 over 2 to the N, which is uh, equal to epsilon. Which is a contradiction because we assume that they're less than epsilon. So just a little remark, exercise, which I think is quite interesting. Remark, exercise. Consider this metric, uh, this function, What's the difference between this one and the other one? This is not metric. Sorry? This is not metric. This is not a metric. That's right. So exercise show this is not a metric. And why is it not a metric? It's to do with the axioms of a metric. Which axiom does it not satisfy? Which is what? Uh, a is equal to zero, but does it imply a equals b? Exactly. Okay? You can find two sequences that are equal to zero here. No, symmetric is true. Because a minus b i, we've got the norm outside. But so uh, I'm not going to spend more time on this, but this will be relevant for what we're going to do next week, actually. So I think it's interesting to think about it a little bit. This is called a pseudometric because it satisfies, in fact, the, the other assumptions of the metric, but it doesn't satisfy this one, that two points at zero distance are the same. But a pseudometric, you can always 
turn it into a metric on a quotient space by identifying all the points that have zero distance. If you identify them, they become the same point, and then you have a metric. Okay? So exercise or something for you to think about is what kind of space do we get when we identify these points? What kind of metric is it? What kind of space is it? And which sequences do we identify? You can, you can work out quite explicitly which sequence you need to identify. Okay? I will just leave it for you to think about a little bit. And the second exercise also is to show that our space sigma 2 plus with this metric, the real metric that we've defined, is a Cantor set. So a Cantor set is a topological notion. It means it's a totally disconnected uh, closed set with no isolated points. Okay? So those are all topological notions that can just be checked from the metric. Okay? So we'll leave again. So these are all very good exercises to really uh, consolidate the properties of this metric in your mind. Okay? Even though it's fairly simple, it's good to consolidated because we'd use it a lot. So before we finish, let's just prove a couple of things, or maybe just one thing, depending on how much time we've got, on using the fact that we now have a metric on sigma. Let's show, for example, that the, the map sigma is continuous in this metric. So lemma... Sigma from sigma 2 to sigma 2 is continuous. Before we prove this, can you tell me if it's invertible? Not invertible? Why not? Why not? Because inverse map is uh, shift to the right. And so? <laughs> OK, so remember that sigma of a0, a1, a2 is equal to the shift to the left. So you lose this. So you get b0, b1, b2, and so on, where bi is equal to ai plus 1. Right, this is the this is the definition of the map. So why is it not invertible? Sorry? Why not? What is the pre image of this sequence here? There's two possible pre images, exactly. You could have a zero here or a one here, and both of them go to the same image. So it's two to one at every point. It's not injective, but it's exactly 2 to 1 at every point. Okay? Nevertheless, we can ask if it's continuous. This is what we're going to ask. So map may be not invertible, but it may be continuous, which means that nearby points map to nearby points. So how do we show that it's continuous? How do we show that it's continuous? Sorry? Basically, yes. Yes, basically, yes. Sigma sequence and sigma sequence distance. Exactly, exactly. So let epsilon, so fix epsilon greater than zero. And we want to find delta. So um, OK, let epsilon greater than zero. Then the distance between sigma of A and sigma of B is less than epsilon if the initial n terms, if the first, if the initial and epsilon terms of sigma A and sigma B are equal. 
abide by that lemma there. So, um, so as long as the initial n epsilon plus 1 terms of A of A and B are equal, then we will have D sigma of A sigma of B less than epsilon. Because if the n epsilon plus 1 terms of this are equal, then the first n epsilon terms of these two will be equal, and then this will hold. Okay? And so we can just let choose delta. So now let delta um, delta equals okay um, okay if delta is sufficiently small the delta is sufficiently small okay then if uh, the distance between a and b is less than delta implies implies this, implies that the first n epsilon plus 1 terms are equal. Okay, and then we have that. Can you even say that this is Lipschitz, this Lipschitz constant two. Sigma is Lipschitz. Sigma is Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant 2. That's true. That's true. The image of two nearby points is multiplied by a factor 2. Yes. Okay, let's one more lemma. We just have a few more minutes. So uh, let's start studying the dynamics of sigma. Now that we have the topology, now that we have a continuous map, we study the topological properties of the dynamics. Before we had the topology, we looked at all the periodic points. And we decided that we had an infinite number, countable number of periodic points. Now we can say a little bit more. So the set of periodic points of sigma is dense in sigma 2 plus. Again, this is just a straightforward application of this, of the properties of the matrix. So how do we, of the matrix, how do we prove this? Yeah? Exactly. So, yeah, that's right. So for any epsilon, so let um, Z bar We need to show that arbitrarily close to this point, there is a periodic point. But it's obvious, right? What's the periodic point that is arbitrarily close? So for any epsilon, there exists a periodic point. Uh, let's call it P. P bar equals P0. P1, P2, and so on, such that um, distance between P and Z is less than epsilon. Because indeed, how do we choose the periodic point? 
exactly. Let P bar is equal to Z0, Zn, okay, for some sufficiently large n depending on epsilon. In fact, it's exactly the n epsilon of the previous lemma. Okay, so next week we will proceed to study the further topology, the fact that it has a dense orbit, and to show that H, now that we have a metric on this and a topology, H is actually a topological conjugacy, so all the topological properties of the dynamics, they map to topological properties of the dynamics of F. Okay, thank you very much.